Okay, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit differently um, than the, the talks you've heard this morning, which have been sort of broadly about, uh, about Keck and instrumentation. I'm going to um, focus in on uh, a couple of uh, just very specific science stories of things that have happened uh, at Keck over the last couple of years. And I'm going to talk about um, the, the outer solar system in particular. So when, when, uh, when I started looking at the outer solar system and studying the outer solar system, if you wanted to study the large objects in the outer solar system, learn something about how these objects were as, as bodies themselves, you didn't have much options. This was uh, um, uh, 12 years ago. You could, you could study Pluto, had a nice big moon, Charon, and the other largest objects that we knew of in the outer solar system in the Kuiper Belt were these tiny little things that, you know, I, I drew them as something you could really see. But even, even with Keck, we couldn't do very much uh, with anything other than, than Pluto and Charon in about 2001. And in 2001, we spent a good bit of time studying these objects, learning about uh, early... Uh, water ice volcanic activity on Sharon about uh, compositions of Pluto, um, but there but there wasn't much else that we could study in detail of these things. So talks about the outer solar system would instead talk about these bodies. Here's here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune orbits. Each of these little black dots out here is is some object in the in the Kuiper belt that some astronomer somewhere has found. And for many years, the study of these bodies was really about treating these as, as point sources, as test particles that told you about the dynamical evolution of the outer solar system. And it was a, it was a great first 10 years of that. We learned an amazing amount of stuff about how the giant planets in the outer solar system rearrange themselves. And you would, you would get a talk based almost entirely on a plot like this. And it doesn't matter what this plot really is of, but you can just look at each of these little dots, which again is a, a Kuiper belt object, and it tells what sort of orbit it has. And you can see that there are these patterns. You can see these, these pile up of objects right there. There's Pluto, in fact, in red. It's just one of these many objects piled up here. There's another selection, collection here, objects strung out along in here. This, this, this uh, plot, this one plot tells you an incredible amount about uh, the, the dynamics of what went on in the outer solar system. Um, but really, uh, you, if, you, if you wanted to learn about the bodies themselves, you were kind of stuck. Uh, this was uh, the, the stage about 12, 13 years ago, and it was, it was frustrating because I was, I, I, deep down inside, I like to think of myself as a spectroscopist, and, 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 and I will actually show spectra today. Um, and it was really frustrating taking, trying to get spectra of these things, and you couldn't. So, so uh, to, just for the main reason of trying to get better spectra, uh, we spent about uh, seven years of really hard work on the Palomar 48 Schmidt and turned the solar system, the outer solar system, to something that looks like this instead found all these largest objects in, uh, that, that we now know of in this, these dwarf planets, as they're called, in this region um, out beyond Neptune. And every single one of these discoveries, all of the, which were made at, uh, at, uh, at Palomar, every one of, single one of these discoveries, the first thing that we did uh, when we would discover them is we would, we would come out here as fast as we could and take spectra. Uh, we would take spectra of all these. We would study these with every technique that we had um, available at Keck. And so I'll, I'll talk about a, a, a bunch of different instruments, a bunch of different techniques, because it was the putting them all together that really gave us these pictures of what's going on in the outer solar system. Each one of these objects, they're, they're, they're all sort of like my kids, I think of them. I have, I have stories I could tell you about each one of these and, and how the, the detective work from, from Keck um, made us understand how, the stories that these things are trying to tell us. And rather than try to give you the, the overview of all of them um, and the, the, the you know, next 30 that you can't see because they're a little bit smaller, I, I just decided to focus on one because it's, uh, it's really kind of the most fun story. So I'm going to talk about Haumea. Haumea um, is also, of course, it's a, it's a good Hawaiian story. Haumea is the, the Hawaiian goddess of, of childbirth. And uh, we, we named uh, the object Haumea in, in honor of all the work that happened here at, at Keck on it. And as you'll see, it's actually a, a fantastic name. We chose it very deliberately in, in Hawaiian mythology. The, the children of Haumea are, are pieces of her that have broken off and populated the Hawaiian islands. And you'll see that this is the case out here in the Kuiper Belt, too. And I'll, I'll show you why. So the first very strange thing that we noticed about Haumea um, came from the, the earliest studies. As soon as it was discovered, we started tracking it with a, with a small telescope, just photometrically. And we realized it gets brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer with about a two-hour period 
Um, two-hour period, so brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer, two-hour period, presumably means the thing is, is rotating. Um, nothing in the solar system that's a, a macroscopic body rotates with a two-hour period. So this would be a really strange thing if it really were rotating with a two-hour period and had a, like a bright side and a dark side. And in fact, if it were rotating with a two-hour period, uh, it would tear itself apart unless it had the density of something like, I don't know, silver or gold or some, some ridiculous uh, dense material. So the reason that we see this brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer um, with this two-hour period is not because it's rotating every two hours, but it's rotating every four hours. And it's an oblong object. So you can imagine it's sort of shaped like this. And it's bright when it looks like this. It's dim when it looks like this. It's bright when it looks like this. It's dim when it looks like this. That was one rotation, uh, but two brighting, brightenings and dimmings. And so that's a nice four-hour rotation period. All these things that we see in the outer solar system are due to reflected sunlight. So when it's bright, it's because you have more reflection area pointing at you. When it's dim, it's because it's like this. And so the nice thing is that the, the ratio of the bright amount, the amount of light in the bright side to the dim side tells you the ratio of the axes of this object. So we can actually measure the shape um, pretty easily for this object. And from the, the, an interesting uh, fun aspect about this is if you know the shape of an object, well, let's say it the other way. If you, know, if you know the rotation period of an object and you know the density of the object and it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, it's behaving like a fluid just like you know, the Earth does. The Earth is a big sphere because it's a fluid. Uh, if you know the shape, if you know the rotation period and the density, it gives you a unique shape. We know the rotation period and we know the shape, so that gives us a, a, a unique way of measuring the density of this object out here, which is, uh, has been traditionally a, an incredibly hard thing to measure for these objects in the outer solar system. So we have a fun way to do it. We know the shape, we know the rotation period, and we can immediately read off that the density is something except we have one big problem, which you probably have already figured out, is that, is that we don't actually know the real shape of the object because we don't know if it's exactly edge on like I was describing it like this, or perhaps it's more like a little bit edge on and it's not getting brighter and fainter as much as it should be, or it's you know, face on and it doesn't change at all. So without knowing that aspect angle, we didn't really know the shape. We had some limits on it, but we didn't know. But we got, we got lucky. And in fact, the story of Haumea is the story of how many different ridiculous ways you can get lucky in the outer solar system. Here's, here's the first lucky. So about uh, two weeks after we discovered um, how man, it was three weeks after we discovered how man, were some of the very first um, LGSAO engineering observations. And uh, they were looking for some nice point source targets to, to test out. And I was like, oh, here, um, look at this object we just discovered. It's a point source, I'm sure. And of course, it's not a point source. There is Haumea right there, and it's, uh, there's its moon, Hiiaka. Hiiaka is one of the children of Haumea. Um, and the, the nice thing about uh, Hiiaka is, is that uh, over the course of the next five months, as engineering observations continued, we got an observation every month for those five months, and, and we got the orbit of Hiiaka around Haumea. And that orbit of Hiiaka around Haumea is, is, is uh, edge on within two degrees. Actually, that was back then. It's even more edge on right now. Uh, it's edge on within two degrees. It's a pretty good guess. And, and turns out to be true, we now know that it's, if you have a satellite going around and you have this huge angular momentum vector from this thing, that it's in the same direction. So chances are, it really is edge on within a few degrees to our line of sight. We really do know the shape of this object and we can really read off the density. When we did that, we were, we were shocked because uh, uh, the density of Pluto has been known to be two for about ever. Uh, so we always assume that every large object in the outer solar system would have a density of 2.00000. And, and this thing has a density of 2.6, 2.6 grams per centimeter cube. The difference between 2.2 and 2. Point, between 2 and 2.6 in the outer solar system is huge. It's the difference between, you know, uh, ice has a density of about one, the rocky material has a density of about three, so Pluto is sort of half ice, half rock. Haumea is almost entirely made out of rock, which is something totally unexpected in the outer solar system. So we thought, um, uh, this, is, this is the shape. I gave you the shape here. This is, it's, uh, it's got a shape. It's rotating really fast. We don't need to see that. But let's, let's talk about uh, the size of it. I'll talk about the fact that it's made out of rock in a minute. First, I'm going to talk about the size 
And how do we get the size? Again, this has traditionally been a hard thing to measure in the outer solar system. But we know the density, and we know the mass now. We know the mass because we've tracked the satellite in orbit around Haumea, and just using uh, simple Kepler's laws, we can tell you what the mass of that central object is. The mass is about a third the mass of Pluto. Um, the density is considerably higher than Pluto. And if you put those two together, you see that, uh, that Haumea, there's Pluto to scale. Haumea, in its long dimension, is about the same size as Pluto. It's a pretty big object out there. There was a, a time when, um, when all the debate about what's a planet and what's not a planet was going on, and there was this, I have to say, ridiculous idea that anything the size of Pluto or larger should be a planet. And I was, if, if, if they were going to stick with that, I was going to argue that Haumea is a planet if you look at it now, now, now. Um, luckily, I didn't have to make that argument. It would have been a pretty ridiculous argument. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty massive object out there. And with its four-hour rotation period, uh, it still is the fastest rotating um, large object anywhere in the solar system. I mean, you know, you can take a rock and make it rotate faster, but anything that's big enough to be held together by gravity, uh, there's nothing that's even close um, to rotating that fast. It's a, it's a, it's really, it really sticks out as a quite strange object when you look at it. Okay, so now let's talk about the fun part, which was getting the spectrum. This was, uh, you know, as soon as we got these things that were bright enough, we could finally go get really good spectra. Uh, we were pretty excited to see what they are. First, I'm going to back up and show you a not exciting spectrum at all. So if we, had, we had been trying to do spectroscopy of these small objects in the Kuiper belt for a long time. And um, here's a typical spectrum from, I don't know, three or four hours on NERC, uh, the poor NERC that you've heard about the demise of earlier. I still mourn every day. Um, here's a spectrum now from uh, one and a half to two and a half microns. It's uh, uh, some of the similar regions that Chuck was just talking about. And in, in spectroscopy in the, uh, of objects in the, in the solar system, you're looking, again, you get, you're looking at the sunlight reflecting off the object. You take out the signature of the sunlight. So you're really looking at how much light that object reflects at every wavelength. And, and a spectrum like that contains the fingerprints of the materials that are on the surface. Every different chemical that you have out there will give you a slightly different uh, reflectance off the surface there. So pretty exciting to be able to, um, from, from this far away, tell you what's on the surface of an object way out there in the Kuiper belt. And uh, you, know, you spend all this time, you, you come back, you reduce the data, and you take a spectrum, and you look like this. And uh, it's really kind of depressing, I have to say. This is about the most boring spectrum you could imagine. Uh, we, in fact, uh, uh, planetary astronomers are, are enamored of classifying spectral types of things in the solar system with letters. Um, and they've used most of them. There are a few letters left. So we have decided this is, this is a class B spectrum object for, for boring. Um, there's really nothing. If you're, if you're desperate, and, and, and I was desperate at the time, you can, you can start to see a little dip right there and a little dip right there. That's one and a half microns and two microns. A dip right there and a dip right there is, is what you would have if there were water, ice, frozen on the surface just a little bit. And uh, trust me, you have to be desperate to see those. And, and we were. And so we were really excited to get this spectrum of Haumea because it's bigger, the spectra are better, and who knows what might happen in the spectrum. Uh, we almost fell out of our seats when we first got this. It's the, it's the points here. This is the same one and a half to two and a half microns as this section right here. I remember I told you the 1.5 absorption and the two... That those two little dips that I was, I was trying to convince you existed just barely on the other one are huge on here. The black, black line is a laboratory spectrum of water ice. It is, this is Haumea has the most pure water ice surface of, of anything, we've been able to, every, anything we've been able to measure in the outer part of the solar system. It's not only just that we can tell you that it's water ice. This little dip right there, 1.65 microns, that only occurs if the water ice is in a pure crystalline form. So this thing is this beautiful uh, crystalline water ice with a density of 2.6, which is a strange um, thing because uh, water ice, of course, has a density of, of 1. So what this is telling us is that this object must look something like this, rocky on the inside, icy on the outside. It's kind of like, a, like an M&M that you really don't want to eat. Um, a very, very strange object. I mean, nothing, no one would ever have guessed that an object like this exists in the outer part of the solar system. And, and we had to scratch our heads 
to, to think of what possibly could have caused something like this. And the, the most obvious answer seems, seemed to me at the time that, that is that uh, Haumea used to be a larger object and another object in the Kuiper Belt came and smacked it, a, a sort of a glancing blow, started it spinning and broke off a lot of the ice that used to be there. Maybe it was bigger and had a lot more ice like this. Uh, broke off that ice, left it spinning really fast. That fast spin will elongate it like that. And, uh, and we're left with uh, the, the, the Haumea that we have today. Um, some picture that looks sort of like this. It's, it's hard to imagine how you could have gotten Haumea otherwise. And yet, when we suggested this at first, the, uh, the, the theorists all scratched their heads and they said, well, you know, the probability of two large bodies like this impacting in the outer solar system is about uh, one part in a billion. And it's not very high probability, um, one in a billion. I, even, even I find that a little bit hard. Uh, so we, uh, we went back and kept working, scratched our heads some, and start, kept studying Haumea with, uh, with a lot of different techniques and thinking about it. And, and uh, one of the things that we were interested in was that moon, Hi'iaka. And the interesting thing about that moon is that it was, it was small compared to all the other moons that have been found um, in, in typical objects in the Kuiper Belt. Here's, here's a random object whose name I even forget in the Kuiper Belt, a rel relatively small object. Most bodies in the Kuiper Belt, if you find moons, which about a third of them do, they're sort of the same size, two objects of nearly the same size. And the, the thought is that it's a, it's a mutual capture that, that makes them in orbit around each other. They get close to each other at some point in the early solar system. Normally they would get close to each other and then they would just get far away because they, they don't have, uh, they, you need to remove energy somehow. But if you get close to each other and there's small particles in the system and dynamical friction can operate, you can get these captured objects and they, they stay captured around each other. And that was the story for everything in the past decade uh, of the Kuiper belt, except for this. It's just, it's really quite small. It's about, about uh, if. We don't know the mass of it, but we think it's something like 1% of the mass of Haumea itself. Very strange to get something that small. Um, it clearly, clearly couldn't have been captured, and so we tried to think of how it might get there. And one of the really, I w I've been trying to think of like highlights of the past 20 years at Keck, and this is one of the highlights of the past 20 years at Keck, is we, we had uh, um, totally unanticipated, uh, we, we had a night to do NERC spectroscopy again. Uh, NERC. Um, and we were, we were doing something else and realized that, uh, that the, took, took a quick image of, of Haumea and its satellite. And the satellite had moved uh, to almost one and a half arc seconds away. When it was first discovered, it was an AO um, observation, but it turned out it went to one and a half arc seconds. We, we could line up the slit. There was no guide star. We had to guide by hand to get the slit lined up perfectly. Uh, but we got Haumea. Here's the actual raw spectrum of Haumea and its satellite, Hi'iaka. And uh, you can see, even in that raw spectrum, I'll show you the real spectrum, you can see something quite dramatic, which is, there's Haumea again, there's that water ice feature, 1.65, these two things, beautiful water ice spectrum. Here's the satellite, and the satellite is even more pure water ice than Haumea itself. So if you wanted to somehow come up with a capture mechanism for, for this, you have to first capture it, which is impossible, and then you have to have accidentally captured the, the most unusual other Kuiper Belt object that we've ever seen. We'd never seen an object like this before. So we thought about this and, and realized that, that actually, you know, the, the story that might explain this very nicely is, uh, is a giant impact. So you imagine that you have two objects um, come together, have this impact. They, they, uh, here's some simulations that were done. These, these simulations were actually done to try to explain Pluto and Charon, and these are the failed simulations. They didn't explain Pluto and Charon but they just put them in the paper anyway. Two objects collide, uh, they, they move apart, make a little tail, they come back together, elongate, uh, they turn into a spiral galaxy momentarily. Um, and then at this point, the, the two bodies merge and you're left with this material on the outside. It's about 1% of the mass, just like Haumea and Higyaka. And um, I should have mentioned that this is, in these cases, this is an iron rock ice body and all the stuff on the outside is ice. It looks just like what you'd expect from something like, I don't know, a giant impact between two objects. So we said, you know, sounds like a giant impact. And the theorists went back and got out their theoretical pencils and said, yeah, no, it's like, a, it's like, it's like one part in, in 100,000. There's no way it could have happened. But 
that was good because we've gotten we've gotten better by a couple orders of magnitude. Um, so uh, one other interesting little thing that uh, that happened again from the uh, the LGSAO is that uh, if you have very sharp eyes, and they have to be sharper than mine because I missed it the first time. There's that little blip right there. Anybody see the little blip right there? That was that a no? Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one that missed it. So this is this is actually our original uh, figure from AppJ Letters on the discovery of Hiiaka. And I think the caption in that AppJ letter says, the, the little object below is a background star that's smeared due to the uh, movement of, of uh, man, but it's not true. It's actually another moon. Um, and uh, that moon is Namaka, another uh, uh, daughter of Haumea. Um, and Namaka, it, so Hiiaka goes around like this. Namaka is slightly different inclination. It's only got a 19-day period. Actually, Namaka and Hiiaka are the two most strongly interacting uh, gravitational bodies in the, in the solar system, with one exception that I'll, I'll leave it as a, as a guess, which bodies change their orbital elements faster than any other two bodies. Any guesses? guesses? No, no. You can ask me later. Um, so it's actually been incredibly hard to figure out the orbits of Hiiaka and Namaka together, because every time you look, they have different orbits. And uh, it, took, it took having several days of observations all in a row, instead of our usual, like, once a month, then the next month, then the next month, because every time it was different. But anyway, the interesting thing about Hiiaka and Namaka, um, in addition to the fact that Hiiaka was this icy object, we have new observations showing Namaka is also an icy object. Uh, there were no other objects in the outer solar system um, at the time that had a second satellite. Everything that was captured was a single satellite. It soon came out that uh, Pluto also had extra satellites too. Pluto is the product of a giant impact. It sounds a lot like the answer is maybe it's a big giant impact. Um, and so the theorists went back and did their calculations. And they said, yeah, it's like one in a thousand. It can't, it can't happen. And I, I say this glibly, but all those, every time that, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that number is updated, uh, it has required major revisions to our understanding of the, of the populations and the history and the formation of the outer solar system. So the, the forcing uh, this idea that maybe something like this happened has really driven uh, many things that we know about the outer solar system today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change gears for a second because, as I said, what I, what I really, really went and found all these objects out there was, was to get spectra. And most of the time I show you spectra of these really large objects and they're really interesting. But uh, um, we, we did spectroscopy of, uh, I think, 70, the 70 largest objects out there in the Kuiper Belt. And most of them, I have to say, were, were pretty boring, like this one, definitely a type B right here. Um, we got really excited when, when ones looked like this. This is, this is Quarwar. Quarwar is one of the, the larger objects out there, and, and it's got water ice absorption in there, too. There's a whole other story about it. It's, it's got methane, which is pretty cool, um, in through here, but you can't see it in that spectrum. Um, but mostly they were really flat, or if they were huge, they had interesting things like uh, 2003 EL61 is, is Haumea before it got a real name. So there's Haumea with its big, but a couple of objects, a couple of random, for no apparent reason objects had these deep water ice absorptions. There's one, there's another one. You can tell these are, these are smaller objects. You can tell they're smaller objects because the, the spectra are, are rattier, um, they're fainter. Here's the satellite again, um, that same deep water ice absorption. There's there's a lab. So it was it was uh, it was interesting. There were just there were just a few of all the ones we looked at, and and we scratched our heads trying to think why would most objects in the outer solar system be kind of boring, um, and with just a few that stick out as these really pure water ice surfaces, and they really do stick out. If you if you make a measurement of how deep those water ice absorptions were, which is you know tells you how much water there is. And you also look at the color, just the optical color of the object. They, 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 most objects in the Kuiper Belt are in this little cluster here, uh, moderately red. Things, things that are really red over here, things that are, are white are over here. They're, they're moderately red. They're just this sort of uninteresting clump. And there are a few, there are a couple large guys that are kind of white. And then there are these with the really deep water ice absorption um, over here that are, that are also really quite white. I mean, they look like ice cubes out there in the outer solar system. Very strange to have a small number of ice cubes in the outer solar system um, until we realized that if you look at their orbits, it all kind of makes sense. So 
I showed you right, right at the beginning this plot of every Kuiper Belt object known and, and their, their orbital parameters, and I didn't talk about it very much, but I was showing you uh, something that looks like this plot up here, which is their, their distance away from the sun, semi-major axis, versus their eccentricity, how elongated their orbit is. And, uh, and I also show you the same thing, distance away from the sun and inclination, how, how tilted they are with respect to um, the, the sun. And what you see is there's a lot of objects out here, and these are all the ones that we have spectra of. The ones with those really deep water ice absorptions, those ice cubes, are these guys right there. And they're, they're not, you, if you look here, they don't necessarily look like they're all in the same place, but you look here in inclination, they, they stick out like crazy. They're all up here at about 28 degrees inclination. They're all stacked right on top of each other. Um, and even in eccentricity space, they're all stacked right on top of each other. Pretty clear um, what you're looking at when you see that. What you're looking at when you see that is the sort of thing that happens when, well, it happens when you have a giant impact. And that giant impact hits a central body and the other, and parts of it fly off that central body. And when parts of it fly off that central body, they move, they go away, they change their orbits a little bit because they're moving with slight velocities. And you can, you can, you can guess, you can estimate how much motion it requires to make that cloud by saying, okay, if, 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 it, if, if everything started out right here and we just had the main body at the beginning and we threw objects off the main body at uh, 150 meters per second, pretty slow actually, you would make a little cloud like this inner cloud here, this inner cloud here. If you threw objects off at 500 meters per second, which is kind of fast, you'd get the big cloud like this. And it really does look like you have a very nice tight 150 meter per second cloud um, with one outlier, we can, we can ignore the outlier. We can always ignore outliers in astronomy, except that the outlier in this case is, is Haumea. Um, Haumea, of course, I mean, the idea would be that Haumea is the one that got hit. It got hit, it got all the chunks of it, these ice cubes that we see out there are the, are the mantle material of Haumea that got thrown out there. But Haumea can't be up there. That makes sort of no sense. Um, but the interesting thing is you get lucky one more time. So let's, we're gonna look at this little region right here. I'm gonna blow up this tiny region of eccentricity space and semi-major axis space. And what we did is uh, just went to the computer and made artificial solar systems, threw down test particles, watched what happened to their orbits as the, as the solar system um, revolved and revolved and revolved. And most of the times, if you put these test particles down, the test particles are all these little dots just things that we put in random places to see what would happen to them. And this is, this is a, a, about a billion years worth of evolution. And like this guy, for example, he doesn't go anywhere in a billion years. In a billion years, this guy goes up and down a little bit. He moves around some, but mostly stays in the same place. By staying in the same place, I mean the orbit doesn't change as it goes around the sun. These dots are the real objects. They don't move at all. Um, the only thing that happens is if you happen to be right here, if you start out right here, you start to oscillate up and down like crazy until you get so high in eccentricity that you begin to uh, cross Neptune's orbit. Once you cross Neptune's orbit, game over. You get either ejected from the solar system or you might get ejected into the inner solar system, become a huge uh, comet, who knows what's gonna happen to you. But right here, the reason that right here you, you have this behavior is because you are in this, this special position where you go around the sun seven times for every, precisely, for every 12 times Neptune goes around the sun. You're in a 12 to seven mean motion resonance, it's called. And it is such a uninteresting dynamical resonance that no one has ever written any paper about the 12 to seven resonance because nothing happens in the 12 to seven resonance. The only thing that happens in the 12 to seven resonance is over about a billion year time scale, you kind of slowly oscillate up and down and, and get ejected. And of course, this one up at high eccentricity, this is Haumea. Haumea is, is right now in that 12 to seven resonance and in, uh, these, these are 100 million year time steps, one, two, three, four, in 400 million years, Haumea crosses Neptune's orbit and it's, it's gone. Um, it would have been really extra confusing had we come back in 400 million years and we find all these little icy objects and not found this guy here, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the perfect part of the story and really cements the idea that all these things were formed right down in here and are part of the same thing. Um, not only is it, could we explain the observations we already had, but we could actually uh, look at other objects. Here's, here's the whole cloud now 
and all the known objects. Haumea is in the 12 to 7, it moved up. There's one more that's in a 7 to 4 resonance and it's moved up and, up and down too. But we could also look to see if there were any other objects that we hadn't looked at um, that were in that region. So there were two that were inside this cloud, 2003, who cares what their names are. These two objects, they're, they're fainter. We didn't get spectra of them because they weren't particularly bright. They were a little hard to get spectra of. But, but, uh, but we could get, instead of trying to get our uh, full spectral range there, we could get a very limited um, spectral range and see what's there. And here's, here's spectra from, uh, from NERC. And here's what they look like. There's, here's Haumea again, that beautiful water ice. Here's 2003 UZ-117. You just see the beginning of that water ice lying down through there. Here's this one. You see the beginning of that water ice lying down through there. It's really, uh, we've actually now been able to go back and, and with a very large HST program, go through and, and fill in the really faint objects. HST has a beautiful um, uh, set of filters, one right here and one right here. And these family members really just stick out like sore thumbs. So, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a fun detective story that I've been, been trying to tell you, and I think the answer, um, as you might see, is that uh, Haumea had this giant impact. It was, it was mining its own business in the outer solar system at, at, a, at a particular time, which we, we couldn't get into, but it was mining its own business. It got smacked obliquely by another object. Its mantle was crack, cracked open, and those chunks of ice went flying off, it tells you incredible things. It tells you that it was differentiated, which we didn't know anything about objects being differentiated. Had to have had the rock on the inside, the ice on the outside. Uh, those, those pieces go flying off. It rotates like crazy. Two of those pieces go into orbit around Haumea. The rest of the pieces go off into, into the Kuiper belt, which we can now um, track back down again. And all this has come about from, from a series of, of observations on, on different instruments, um, but all with Keck, where we, we were just looking at different aspects of it and then finally um, pull it all together again. So it's just, this is one of my favorite of the, the Keck detective stories. Um, all the rest of the objects out there that I didn't have a chance to talk about have, have similar sort of uh, stories going on, but this is, I think, my favorite one. So I thought I would share it with you today.